It's often said that life is about the journey, not the destination. Well, Mubarak Moyika's path to success is like none you've ever heard. Growing up in Kenya's middle class and orphaned at a young age, opportunities in the tech industry were limited. But as Mubarak tells it, he refused to be a victim. Driven by his competitive spirit and win-at-all-cost attitude, Mubarak first revealed his knack for technology by taking the top spot in not one, but two nationwide science fairs and went on to launch a web services business at the age of 17. Now at 26 years old, Mubarak is in Silicon Valley with a new company and a dream to bring big tech to Africa's small businesses. In this episode of Influencers, I'm joined by Mubarak Muyika, founder and president of Zagis, as we discuss his entrepreneurial journey, why he turned down a scholarship from Harvard, and what he admires about billionaires Warren Buffett and Bill Gates. Hello and welcome to Influencers. I'm Andy Sherwer and welcome to our guest Mubarak Moyika, who is the founder and president of Zagas, an enterprise software company. And Mubarak joins us from Nairobi. Mubarak, nice to see you. Thank you very much uh, for having me here. So I want to ask you about your company and it, it's fascinating. You've got a, an incredible story. Um, first of all, why don't you tell us about what Zagis does? Zagis is an enterprise management platform that seeks to make enterprise software basic and accessible to all with a focus for small businesses. That's uh, basically what Zagis does. And, uh, and that's what it is. And who do you compete with and who are your customers and how does that all work? Um, we, we compete with a number of customers that are, are described as point tools. So the first point tool that we consider a competitor is uh, QuickBooks. QuickBooks and uh, TurboTax, those are primary competitors, but they, they don't address the direct line of business that we're in because we have a suite of products that focus on making a full experience for small businesses. But TurboTax and QuickBooks tend to focus more on accounting and the taxation piece. So we tend to address uh, a wide range of business, small business needs. So you find that small customers uh, tend to use a variety of tools. They could use Excel at one point, you could use a different subscription. So when you tend to look at the experience of a small business, it's more like it's just a chaotic alternative to Zagis. They, are, they have all these subscriptions they have to use. And are your customers in Africa or are they all over the world? Um, we have customers in over 60 countries. Our, our primary and largest customer market is uh, in Africa, but then over time, uh, the, business, the business needs and the business patterns are almost the same in different parts of the world. So it's enabled us to acquire customers from different parts of the world. I want to talk about your story. As I, as I mentioned, it's, it's a pretty incredible one, but you had personal tragedy. You were orphaned at a young age and then started a business when you were 17. Can you talk about your upbringing um, first for us? Okay, so I, I grew up I grew up in a household that was uh, pretty uh, middle class from a Kenyan standard at the time that uh, uh, that's like in the 90s, being born in the 90s, my dad being a civil servant. So it was a pretty uh, middle class standard uh, type of a lifestyle and then when my dad passed on, there used to be a number of circumstances that we started to experience. That's from like, uh, we were having issues keeping up with uh, our actual lifestyle, our, our beating our bills, living as a single mother. So it was really uh, a challenge. So in all that period, it was an environment that was super competitive because we used to have uh, multiple relatives and multiple friends that we'd have, suddenly we couldn't keep up. So it used to feel like it was really a big deal to keep up. So in that whole process, uh, at a later time, a couple of years later, I lost my mom too. So when I lost my mom, it became uh, a point where it required that I personally start to take care of my younger brother 
and start to be like, uh, I forward think and make sure that all problems that we have are solved. Not more than just experience it, but they needed kind of solutions. So in that whole process, uh, where multiple uh, relatives supported, and then in the whole process of supporting, uh, I'd grown up being a competitive person. That's from my childhood. I'd like video games that always wanted to win. So it was always a thing of mine. So in that whole process, me, I, I figured that me, I'm not going to be a victim or any of this kind of stuff. So my only thing is that what's my play and how I'm going to win. So that's what I became my focus. So when I got into high school, the, the very first thing that uh, really uh, changed my perspective in high school was the fact that I actually never got into a high school that I really wanted to because I, I kind of felt like it wasn't like super, the, the, like the really best, but it was really good. And so it made me feel like I, 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 I got beat to at some point something that I'm not used to. You know, I'd gotten used to winning, getting what I want. So when you fail to get that at some point, it makes you feel like you need to compete even better. So when that when that began to happen in high school, we had this uh, uh, situation or uh, school arrangement where there were science fairs that you could participate in and like and like compete uh, in schools like all over the country. So it had multiple stages. So you you'd have to like come up with a project, convince people to work with you, convince like multiple people to support it by allocating resources and multiple things. So from that whole experience. Uh, I got into I got to a national level when I was about uh, 17. That was like the I was actually I was actually not 17. I was 16. Then that was just like I was the youngest person to be like get to the national level. It was a completely new experience for the first time at my age. Like I could see people from different schools. I had a perspective that was like a, a national level. So the whole thing about it was that it became like uh, a new reality that I, I had to embrace. So with that, the following year now, I became the best. And when I became the best at national level, you know, I had known a couple of people so many times. So the thing was now, what's the next thing? The next thing was now, how do I look at, at it from an international level? So you know that in high school, I, I won two awards at the national level, and that's uh, the science fairs. Although I had multiple projects, all of them at the national level, but the two of them that I won was more of a perspective of, of things that were my interests, things that I liked, and things that I really believed were, were the best. And so, and so with that, it, it changed my game from an aspect of persons that I interacted with, because like uh, the largest companies in Kenya were the ones like supporting the, the event. So it felt like a really new experience. So with that, uh, a new, a new, a whole new angle came in. Some of the participants that were in all that thing, I'd really defeated them. And then there was this aspect of a Pan-African competition called the Anzisha Prize. So it used to be, it was more like uh, I'd been beaten at a point of something that I didn't know about. So uh, I entered it the following year and I actually won an award for the work that I was doing uh, with a company called Hype Century. So Hype Century was a company that I started uh, when I was in my final year in high school. The specific thing about it was uh, it came as a result of uh, my initial innovation, which was creation of a database to track multiple tracking uh, tracks for oil tankers and and for just purposes of management of business, of management of a business. So with all that, I used to get requests for from clients to build websites. And then in that whole process of building websites, the clients were starting to stack up. And when they started to be like so many, right. what used to be the case, uh, I got, uh, I, I decided to structure a business in which uh, companies could pay subscriptions and then let me let me just jump in here so at, at, at some point you applied to harvard though and right. then got a scholarship but decided not to go tell yeah. us that. Actually, actually what was the case was this um when i won the award when i won the award in my in my uh the very first time at national level the thing became what's the next best thing for somebody of that level which was the advice of multiple partners and teachers and stakeholders that were involved in my life, including uh, one of 
one of the one of the uh, chairmen of the companies that was uh, uh, supporting the the whole event, Chris Kirubi. So he had been an alumni of Harvard, and so it felt like the next best thing to do, considering he's also an alumni of my school, and he'd gotten to the almost the highest level from a business perspective. So I applied to Harvard, and it was something that I felt like was the best thing for me at the time. So I, I was supported through the whole application process, and, and, and it was really an amazing experience. But then it got to a point where uh, I did not know about this piece about where I had some, some of my peers like had actually won an award, which was this Anzisha. So it brought in like a new dynamic in, in the competition because for the first time, what I felt I was going to do at Harvard from a software engineering perspective, I felt like some of my peers already had raised funds, they already had employees, and they were already competing. And that would take me like five years behind for me to actually catch up with them. So it became a situation where like I decided, no, scrap this. I have to remain ahead. So that whole process made me decide like I can put a weight on this. And actually what I decided at the time is that I'm not going to think about this Harvard thing anymore. I just want to win fast. Then in the process of winning, that became a process of like three years by the time I came to think about it again. Did you ever have any regrets about um, not going to Harvard? Uh, I actually, I never thought about it like that because my thing about it was winning. I wanted to win at all costs because the problem at the time was I used to, every time I'd look at multiple people and peers, I'd be like, what does it take to be number one? What's so different from that guy and me? So I, so that whole thing used to be like that. So, and at the time there was, there were multiple people who I felt had beaten me. And if I was going to go down that road, I was going to be five years behind. Mm. So I, I, I wouldn't say I regret. I just think that there was a different path to take. Right. And, and you made your way to Silicon Valley eventually. Uh, talk to us about that. Yeah. So the, the, the very first thing was, you know, uh, with, the, with this whole experience about raising money, reality started to set in from a business perspective. So the ecosystem in, in Kenya and Africa is pretty much very small. And it was really small at the time. So from a fundraising perspective, we were looking at a situation where I already had close to a thousand, a thousand business customers. And in Nairobi, from a perspective of uh, 2013, 2014, that was like really huge. Because if you, if you have really huge corporate customers, any expansion in business would mean extending into a business line that's outside my, my, scope of, my scope of excellence or my scope of expertise. So it got to a point where the only, the only most relevant place where it would be practical to expand to and move to would be the Bay Area. Because at the time, uh, we, we had, I had multiple contacts I had interacted with from investors to customers to different mentors who were helping out and they had multiple people that uh, had been supported to move to the Bay Area to raise funding, get customers. So it became a thing that was the next best thing to do when you reach a certain customer point. So it is at that point that it became obvious and necessary that moving to the Bay Area is the next most practical thing. So I, what I decided to do, I decided that uh, this is uh, an important and crucial thing. So I made a business decision to decide to uh, expand to the Bay Area. That was like having the company registered, getting an office, and moving to the Bay Area to start with initially with a focus to get investors. But then when I got to the Bay Area, the thing at the time was I didn't I didn't think that it would turn out the way it did because I think the experience was so blissful. Because one, at the time, there was this thing that uh, Obama was a Kenyan. So when I got to the Bay Area, being a Kenyan was just like the coolest thing I've ever experienced in my life. <laughs> I was treated so well. I was invited to so many places. I used to get so many messages and so many emails that it took me to close to two years to actually read them. Because at the time, the experience was just, it, so in that whole process, I figure that there's actually possibility of value add and expansion in terms of business from things like joint ventures, from things like partnerships, 
where products can actually products from Africa can actually be sold to uh, different U.S. customers, bundled together, and that whole that whole thing. So in that whole process, I, I figured out a way in which uh, we can structure a corporation. That's with advice from multiple uh, mentors and multiple partners who are helping out, and that's pretty much how I ended up in the Bay Area. Then ever since, it's been it's been more like it's been more like a thing that's been like really uh, good because it's it's really helped with business development around the world because mm. that that single thing has given uh, has given uh, Zagis uh, the ability to like acquire customers in multiple places around the world with so much ease and 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 the level of sophistication also changed significantly because the amount of data that we're working with in Nairobi as a Nairobi company is really different from what we do now from uh, as a multinational company and then the operations and you mentioned how it was advantageous to be from africa when um, barack obama was president had things gotten more difficult when donald trump was president because of course he notoriously denigrated african countries um i i, I i'd say i'd say that trump is more of a businessman than obama so the thing is uh, what happens is that at the time I was, people didn't meet me like a businessman. People met me as a Kenyan. So during Trump's time, I'd evolved. I'd become, I'd become, I'd grown up. So my interactions with people are more business terms, agreements. So I'd say that it didn't affect much. It was just at a different time, and I'd grown up. Right. Okay. Um, yeah. So Zaghi's found a, a market uh, in the trend of African companies going online. Where does that trend stand now? And has COVID-19 accelerated that? Big time, big time. As of today, as of today, we are doing close to uh, 10 million signups. Businesses that we've acquired through multiple product stacks uh, from, uh, from businesses that have signed up online, from resellers or partnerships. With all that, we've gotten like uh, approximately 2 million paying customers. So this whole process is 70% uh, of the customers come from Africa and it's largely driven by COVID-19. And then the other thing about it is that what's really driving growth in Africa isn't really COVID-19, is about big tech politics in the Bay Area. Because you realize that the tech ecosystem in Africa isn't controlled in Africa. If you want to expand a business in Africa, it doesn't make sense to, ex to really invest in Africa. You invest in the Bay Area because that's where there's the talent, that's where there's the big tech. And, and so it's more, of, uh, it's more of we are at a point where the next uh, billion customers for the, for the big tech, the big five, are going to come from Africa. Thus, this we are talking about a population that's going to be joining the internet as users or, or becoming or, or becoming banked users. That's from an aspect of fintech. Persons who have no persons who have no access to banking facilities or have no access to internet. And it also pre presents a direct opportunity considering the countries are so many and it's so different. So regulation is easy to go around as compared to a country like India, which offers the same opportunity for big tech in the Bay Area. So the, the, so the thing about it becomes that the only way we can live with the trend in Africa to become a big tech company in Africa, we have to be like the big five in the Bay Area and be like we, are, we follow them. So we're just like a bear on their back. Let, let me. I want to get back to uh, Zagis in, in a minute, though. But uh, I want to ask you about COVID in in Kenya and, and in East Africa generally. What is the situation like there right now? Um, the situation. I think the situation is really could be really bad. But the problem is that there's uh, one. The economy is really bad, and then the process of tracking it is really slow. So we cannot get an accurate picture in the short term. So right now the information is is foggy and hazy, but what I'd say the situation could be really bad because what's on the ground and what's reported takes time before you can actually match the two. Right. So getting back to your company, how big is it right now, Mubarak, in terms of revenue, and what are the key ingredients for growth? Um, I think I, from from an aspect. 
from an aspect of uh, last year, we did uh, around 2 million in revenue. And the key aspects of growth are, we're talking about users, APIs, uh, those, are, those are just the main things that are driving growth uh, in the short term. And here we're talking about users, we talk about small businesses and individual solopreneurs. Right, and how fast is the company growing right now? How do you measure that? Um, I'd say, I'd say, I'd say, we during since COVID started, we've done like close to uh, five million signups. Businesses that we would never have had access to that we do have access to right now from the multiple product stacks. Right. Do you think there's room for a company like you in enterprise software with all the big giants like Salesforce and Oracle? Big time. There is so much room for us. Because you see, the biggest the biggest problem about small businesses is usually around customer lifetime cycles and the support cost. So our innovation isn't really enterprise software. Our innovation is the distribution. What we've innovated is the distribution. So our part, uh, the main reason why we 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 built Zagis is more of to make enterprise software basic and accessible to all. So the enterprise software already existed and it will continue to exist. But is it an Oracle thing to make it basic and accessible to all? Definitely not. And that's not their business. So, and then the other thing is that the economics around getting small business owners and solopreneurs are completely different from enterprise customers. Because from the time they begin to pay, from the amount of data that it requires to collect for them to actually find value in those products. So there is room for us. Big time. And, and you talked about how you were accepted when you went to Silicon Valley because you're from Kenya. Right. Um, but on the other hand, have you faced any issues of discrimination or being limited in terms of the capital that you like to get because you're a person of color? Um, I'd say how I'd look at it is more, I felt that, but I haven't felt, this, I haven't like experienced it directly. Because I've been I've been fortunate because at the time that most of the people that I got to interact with were persons that uh, looked at me as a person of industry, as a professional in industry. So it wasn't more of like a starter thing. And in as much as the discrimination exists, I didn't experience it because of a controlled network and a controlled group of people that were helping me out. So yes, it's there from an aspect of from an aspect of. Uh, 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 larger rounds, but then I haven't like had first-hand personal experience where someone has directly done it to me as a person individually. Do you see other people in your shoes in Kenya and maybe beyond in Africa who need financing who can't get it, or do they have access to capital? Um, I think I think it's a really big problem in Africa. But there, in, you see, in terms of a corporate. You, if you structure matters as a corporate, there are many ways to go around some of those things. Because I think about it like this. If if, if I, I have 50 billion that I am to give to somebody in, in the Bay Area and to give to someone in Nairobi, I definitely have a preference for someone that I know in an environment that I know. So if you look at it from that perspective, I think it isn't more about discrimination. It's about how to structure it. Because it's more about just comfort. People People tend to work with people that they feel comfortable around and people that they feel comfortable with. So I look at it from that perspective as, a, as opposed to an aspect of discrimination, because the issue is usually, yes, you can say there's discrimination, but is there really value add to match up the need for that money? Because the problem becomes, uh, in as much as there are so many people who don't have funding, there are also not very many good innovative stuff that need actually the money. Most of it is just stuff that that can't pass the statistical viable to meet those investment needs. So if you look at it from that perspective, any business or innovation that can is financially viable and sustainable over time can have access to funding with proper corporate structuring that can still be discrimination problems. What tech companies are American tech companies have large market shares in Nairobi? In other words, is it Apple, is it Facebook, is it Twitter, do people use Skype? What are the tech products and services that Kenyans use? Yeah, we're, talking, we're talking like Facebook, uh, uh, Twitter, 
Netflix, and uh, yeah, I think WhatsApp. So pretty much those those are the main ones from an aspect of the largest number of customers. Uh, actually, Facebook is more a pointer in terms of how we grow in the business because of their 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 style of business operation. And I want to ask you about microfinance because that's a popular way for Western entrepreneurs to support businesses in developing countries. Do you see that in Kenya much? And what do you think about that? Um, microfinance is a really reliable thing because it creates a personal relationship between the financing and, and the persons involved. But then the thing about it is that it, it may be good for small scale, but the impact, the impact is only from an aspect of getting out of poverty, but not business, big business growth. It can work for small, for, for like small businesses and individuals from an, a poverty perspective, and it's really sustainable. But when it comes to big business, I think it's a really unsustainable model because it creates politics in big business and then brings in unnecessary bureaucracy from an aspect of big business operation. Mubarak, you mentioned that the economy is not very good in Kenya. Why uh, is that? I think I think it's because of uh, one this one this there's a there's a discrepancy between information that we acquire from dead and corruption matters. So what usually happens is that the stories that we read today are information that would take more like three months for you to actually get a clearer picture of what's going on, and that's from an aspect of uh, government information and independently collaborated information because we have constant information being disputed over time. So the only way you can have information that's constantly reliable is that it takes like three months or something like that. So, so the economy, the economy is really bad because of one, the debt thing, and then the COVID situation, and then you add to that the corruption. So when you bring in the corruption in the equation, information exchange gets hazy because we cannot tell what's what up to a certain point when it's it's undisputable or indisputable. And do you live full time in Nairobi or do you split time between Nairobi and Silicon Valley? Where do you where do you live most of the time? I actually, I actually moved full time to, the, to Silicon Valley. I only I only come to Nairobi like once in a while because it's more of I have family and and family ties and and things like those. So it, it's more of uh, I moved to the Bay Area fully. Who are your role models, Mubarak, in terms of tech uh, CEOs and, and, and leaders and maybe people in other fields of endeavor? I'm, for instance, Gates and Zuckerberg dropped out of Harvard. <laughs> do, you, do you look to them? Um, I, I'd say I look to Bill Gates quite a bit from an aspect of competitiveness and from an aspect of focus. Because he, I, he has this ability to look at things and look at them to a level that until he gets what he wants. But I think what I borrow mostly, who I borrow mostly from, is Warren Buffett. Because I think Warren Buffett represents, uh, he represents a mature American business person that is so neatly organized and thorough and to the point. Have you ever met Warren Buffett or been to the Berkshire Hathaway annual meeting? No, but I, I will one day. And what about the rest of your career and your life, uh, Mubarak? You're only 26 years old. What are your aspirations? What do you hope to achieve over the next decade and throughout uh, your lifetime? No, I think, I, think, I think the most important thing is, is to figure out a way in which uh, I can make enterprise software basic and accessible to all. That's around the world, just not in Africa, thanks to statistics and newly acquired information that informs insight on multiple things. So I think for the foreseeable decade, that I think is what I'd really want to achieve. Because what we've been able to do is make, make enterprise software standard, because which was something that was really not possible in the past. And, and last question, uh, Mubarak, if you had if you could ask Warren Buffett one question, what would it be? I'd say, I'd say, I'd say investment, but then, yeah, I'd say uh, investment. You'd ask him about investment? Right. Not actually investment. I'd actually ask him to invest with me. Oh, you would ask him to invest. <laughs> right. Good one. Love it. 
All right, we're going to have to leave it there. Mubarak Muyika, who is the founder and president of Zagis. Thank you so much for joining us, Mubarak. Thank you. You've been watching Influencers. I'm Andy Serwer. We'll see you next time.